to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also have overcome or overcame, and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We know the Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's ask him to help us in our time. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for the day. Thank you that you're in control of the weather. And you give us what we need, what we stand in need of, not only physically, but spiritually, emotionally, mentally. And you are the provider. Thank you, Lord, that we're reminded of that when the weather changes and it rains or snows it's cloudy, the sun is shining. You're in control of all things. So we pray, Father, that for a few moments now we might center our attention upon you as we consider right before the church is called away, what we call the tribulation period will begin we get a picture, a snippet of you and what you are doing. So that is certainly currently in our present time. As we have considered the seven churches which represent Christendom, and we learn and we see what applies and where are we, we then give us this picture of what you are doing. So we pray, Father, that we might understand what it is that you want us to know today. Speak to our hearts. We ask that he, the Holy Spirit, do that which only he can do as he compels and constrains and comforts and even convicts us. Lord. And I pray, Lord, that our eyes would be open, that we can see and our ears open that we can hear, and our minds open that we can know the mind of the Father. So visit us once again. Have mercy upon us. Help us to understand, Lord. It's in your name we pray. And amen. So we are looking at the place and attitude of Christ. At the end of the church age, prior to the church being called away and the beginning of the days of tribulation, as we'll see those in coming weeks, what that looks like. And we find Christ saying there in verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I want to consider that word, behold. When we see that word, it's asking us to do more than just to look at something. It's asking us to see and then to comprehend what it is that we are looking at. Behold, he says, grabs our attention, we know that it's an imperative, which means that it's a command, and the subject is an understood you, you behold. He wants us to be able to see this picture that is illustrated for us, if you will, and he wants us to ponder to think about, to consider what it is that you are looking at. We find ourselves <clears throat> really busy with a lot of things in our life, and I don't know that we often behold things. We see things, 
as they pass us by, we look at them. And I've even thought, you know, sometimes even when we're on vacation and we go somewhere and we see this beautiful sight and then we got to go see another one. And then while we're there in that place, we might not ever be back again. Let's get in all that we can. And that's fine. But I wonder if we ever really behold things. We see them. But do we really take the time to think about what we are looking at? And that can be true in all aspects of our life. That can certainly be true even as we look at one another. We take the time, whether it be a spouse or children or grandchildren or whoever it might be, that we are beholden. Take the time to look at this picture and think about what is it that we are seeing. And so what is the picture then that he wants us to see? What's the illustration? That Jesus is standing at the door and is not. He wants us to visualize that and to think about what does that mean? Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Son of God who would take on flesh as a baby, and we're going to celebrate here in a couple of weeks, wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger, who would live his life, preach, teach, be crucified on the third day, rise again from the dead, and ascend back to the throne room of the Father. <clears throat> the same Jesus. At the end of the church age, which is where we are currently living, he wants us to see that he is standing at the door and is not. He says, think about it. And so as we behold that, I think that there are some things that we can learn. Some things that it says to me as I think about this picture of the Son of God standing at the door and knocking, knowing that the end of the age is coming, that the church will be called away, the Holy Spirit will be removed from this earth, and tribulation will fall. He's standing at the door and knocking. What does that mean? Well, I'd like to give you six things. Number one, it lets us know and reminds us that there is no universal salvation. That is... Not everybody is going to be saved. There are those who believe that in the end, everybody's going to be saved. It's all going to be okay. And the whole universe will be in heaven. If this is true, then there would be no reason for Christ to be standing at the door and knocking. If everybody's going to be saved, then just go on in. And save this one, and save that one, and save this one. While there is no universal salvation, number two, salvation is universal. There is no universal salvation. Not everyone is going to be saved automatically. But salvation is universal. That is, it is for everyone. What does he say? If anyone will open the door, then I will come in and dine with him. 
anyone. And we know other passages that talk about whosoever will. But he says, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone, that lets me believe then that he is knocking at everyone's door. Everyone gets the knock. And whoever opens the door, answers the knock, comes, I will come in and dine with him. Salvation is for everyone. If it was just for, you know, I'm gonna, you're gonna be saved, you you're not. You can be saved, not you. And what would be the point of knocking? It would seem to me to be ludicrous to knock if I've already decided, yep, you're in, you're not, you are, you're not. Salvation is available for everyone. Number three, it lets me know that there is no spark of divinity within any of us. There are those who believe that there is some type of divineness within us, some spark, and all it really needs is for us to just like fan it, do some good things, really concentrate on being a good person, get that spark going, and before long, it's a raging fire and I'm all good. If that is true, then what's the point of Christ on the cross? What's the point of him standing and knocking? If it's all within you, if I can take care of this myself, then there would be no need for that. No, we know that there's no good in any of us. We believe in the total depravity of man. There's none righteous, no, not one. The only thing that's good about me, the only thing that is righteous about me that ever will be is the righteousness that is Christ Jesus. The only goodness, the only good thing about me is the goodness that he has imputed to me through faith in him alone. There's no universal salvation, but yet salvation is universal. There is no spark of divinity. There is nothing that I can do to get myself to God. Christ himself made it very clear. No one. I like how in the scripture it is very specific. All inclusive, if you will, or exclusive. No one. Anyone. Whosoever will. There is no one that goes to the Father except through the Son. So what else do I learn by having this picture of Christ standing at the door and knocking? Number four, we must hear the knock. We have to hear the knocking on the door. You ever wonder why uh, we put uh, doorbells in? That way it can go throughout the whole house, right? And people have different rings and different ring tones and all that, but it really plays throughout the house so that you can hear it. You might miss the knocking there. It might be that it saves people from knocking, I don't know. But the point is, is that they want the people inside to be able to hear. Do we hear the knocking? Are we listening? We live in a time in the world where uh, there's very little time. I'm just thinking about that song we were singing, Silent Night. I don't know how much silence there is in our lives today. It's time to think, to hear. We must hear the knocking. And then when I hear the knocking, you know what automatically happens then is that I have to make a decision of what I'm going to do in response to the knocking. What am I going to do? Well, maybe it doesn't happen in your house, but sometimes the decision is, did somebody get that? 
I'm busy. Or I've got something to do. Or aren't you closer? But we have to make a decision on what we're going to do about the lock. Or the doorbell. We decide if we're going to go and open the door or see who's there. Or if we're just going to let them knock. Or we wait, see if anybody else will go and open the door. Now there's a decision that is made when you hear the knocking. It's one thing uh, that I, there are many things I love about this time of year, but just Christmas reminds people of Christ. And they have to do something with that. When you say Merry Christmas, that reminds them that it's all about Christ and they have to do something with that. They have to make a decision. So the door is knocking, I hear it, then I gotta make a decision about how I'm going to respond. And then when we come to the door, you know, you can, maybe your door has the little peepo, right? And you can look through there. I can't ever see you, by the way. I don't know if it's my vision or what. You look through there. Who is it? I don't know if people really do that much anymore. You can see who it is. Some people have these uh, doors, and then the side of the doors, there's glass. It really doesn't make a lot of sense to me because you lock the door and then you have glass right beside of it. So if the bad guy just wanted to break the glass, reach in there and lock it. But nevertheless, you can look out that glass and see who's there. And when you see who's there, you still have got to what? Open the door. So we have to be listening. We have to hear the knock. And then we make a decision about how we're going to respond to that knock. And then when we get to the door, we have to open. And so I wanted to ask the question, why is Jesus not? It's not a trick question. It would be the same reason why any of us are knocking on any door. He wants somebody to come to the door. If I go and I knock on the door, if someone is there, I'm hoping that they will come to the door and open it. That would be the reason why I'm knocking at the door. He wants us to hear it. And we see who's there. And we open. If we open the door, then there is a conversation that takes place. There's a greeting, right? Most of the time when you open the door, both parties don't just stand there and look at each other, right? If you know the person, then you'll normally usually say something like, hey, hello, how are you? If you don't know the person, then you kind of, if they don't say anything, then you're going to say, how can I help you? We probably won't say, who are you? But we would say something like, well, can I help you? And the person then would tell us what they're there for. There's this conversation that takes place. <coughs> There's a greeting. And then there is an invitation to come in. Now, I won't pause there for a moment. Jesus is knocking on the door. And the reason he's knocking on the door is that he wants you to come to the door, open it, and let him in. Now sometimes, we might hear the door, and we might look at each other and say something like, uh, 
Are you expecting someone? Is there somebody coming over? Did you forget to tell me that we have guests coming? And maybe it's not every home, but we might get into a little bit of a panic. And we want to put the clothes away. There are additions in the sink. Should I knew I should have taken care of it. What does the bathroom look like? Maybe they won't need to go. And so when we get guests unexpectedly, we might get in a little bit of a panic and want to fix some things. We'll be right there as we're getting all the clothes in the basket and put them, you know. You can always put things in your bedroom, shut the door, because they shouldn't be going into your bedroom. I want you to know this. That Christ does not ask you to clean your house. He doesn't ask you to try to get everything right and try to fix everything that is broken. What he's asking for is for you to open the door so that he can come in and he can clean the house. He can come in and fix what's broken so that he can come in and make things right. Many times we think, oh, I, I, I'm too broken. There's too many bad things. And you're right. You can't fix that. Only Christ can. He knocks at the door and he wants you to just come and open the door, answer the door, and let him in. Many times I think that churches, they want people to come, but they don't want any broken people. Get everything fixed, then you come. Be the perfect family. Be everything, you know, all good and nice and all that. He doesn't ask us to try to clean everything. That doesn't mean that he is overlooking our sin. What it means is, is that he's going to come in and he's going to fix it. He's going to cleanse us. He's going to wash us. He's going to forgive us. He's going to mend the broken heart. How do, you, how do you fix those things? You don't. You can't. Lord, can you just wait until I get my heart back together? It's been broken. Lord, can you wait until we fix our relationship? Lord, can you wait until we get everything right and the kids are all obeying everything? Never going to happen. And it wasn't what he intended for. He wants you to come and let him in so that he and fix what's broken. So when we greet people at the door, if we know who they are, we typically say, come on in. Especially if it's bad weather, you know, come on in, get in, out of the rain, out of the weather. We will normally offer them a place to sit, and we might think about, what's he talking about when he says, I will come in and dine with you. You realize that that is just a natural thing, really. In the South, if you go to visit, you can expect that they have sweet tea just waiting. Some cookies or biscuits in here would be different things that we offer, but we usually, you know, come in, sit down. And we'll say something like, can I get you something to drink? Are you thirsty? You know where that came from? It came from travelers. And travelers uh, who are on the dusty road, uh, who have been traveling for a while, they don't just have, you know, the coolers that we think of now. And you've got uh, a whole case of water. When we go places, I'll buy a whole case of water. And I don't know why I do that. Because there's like 40 in there. And we're never going to drink all of those. But just in case. Not so then. You come and you're thirsty. You haven't drank in a while. You dry. It's dusty. And the first thing would be, hey, can I get you a drink? And we do the same thing. Can I get you something to drink? Can I offer you a drink? 
And then if we have anything left over, any goodies, you know, can, can I get you a snack? Do you want a sandwich? Do you want some leftover turkey, right? Maybe you don't still have leftover turkey. It's a natural thing to invite people to come because it's intimate. Right? If you think about it, our holidays, what, what do we do? We gather around the table and break bread together, don't we? Thanksgiving, what do we do? We eat Thanksgiving together. We're around the table, whatever that looks like for you. At Christmas, we're going to have a meal. And we're going to sit down and we eat. It's an intimate thing that we do. And Christ wants to do that in our lives. He wants to come in and have this intimacy with us. To dine with us. To eat with us. So what's the door that he's knocking on? I already said that every individual, their heart's door, if you will, he's knocking, wanting to come in to provide salvation. Every family. And the family is an institution that was devised by God and blessed by God. And it's the one institution that Satan is doing everything he can to destroy. Every family, Jesus is standing at the door of that family and he's knocking and he wants to be in. He wants to be a part. He wants to be intimate. He wants to sit down and dine with you. He wants to fix what's broken. But he's also standing at every church. Wanting somebody open the door and let him in. One of the saddest pictures I think that I've ever seen in a painting depicts this verse and it has Jesus standing outside of the church and he's knocking at the door. Inside the church they're singing, they're praising, the church is full, they're doing their activities but nobody hears the knocking at the door <clears throat> and Jesus is left on the outside. The same thing then. As we can imagine this picture. Of Jesus standing outside. The heart's door of our loved ones. And our neighbors. And our children. And he's knocking. Nobody hears. Nobody answers. The world. We're praying for our nation. For Israel. For the world. And we see all of the corruption. And. And there is Jesus not. The time is at hand. He realizes that the end is coming quickly. He even says back in verse 11, Behold, I am coming quickly. And so he is not. Do we see that picture? Do we behold? And understand what it is that we are looking at. You realize that I don't know of any other God. And all the gods that are out there. The Hindu gods, the Greek gods, the Roman gods, the Egyptian gods. For all those gods, you have to go to them. And you have to try to get their attention, right? You go and you make offerings and you make sacrifices and you yell and scream and holler and cut yourself and do all kinds of things to try to get them to answer you. But the God of the universe, our God, what does he do? He comes to us and he knocks. If anyone hears him and lets me in, I will come and dine with him. If any family will hear my knocking and open the door and let me in, I will come into them and dine with them. If any church 
who appear my life and open the door, I will come in and die with them. Behold, what we see, do we understand what we are looking for? Father, I thank you for the truth of your word, and I pray, Lord, that you'll help us. As we try to visualize the King of Kings, the Son of God, our Lord and Savior, knocking, wanting to be allowed in. Somebody come to the door and open it. And whoever does that, I will come in. Now I'll fix what's broken. I'll heal the broken heart. I'll cleanse the sin that you can't get rid of. I'll wash you as white as the snow. Just let me in. The family and all of its busyness and everything that we're trying to do. Just want to be let in. Open the door. Lord, our church, may we always be listening for the knocking and open the door. Pray that you would speak to our hearts together. May we truly behold our God standing at the door and knock. The time is at hand. It's getting close. Answer the door.